Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this initial series, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen with our own pitchers at S2 Breakthrough as we've collected more and more data. Some of the topics we'll cover include how we've shifted the way we understand and train pitch types, how to maximize game day prep, and generally how we use data to create systems and approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. This podcast is sponsored by Yakertech, softball's first in-game optical tracking system and most accurate data capturing solution. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle. This is Ashley Sunshine, uh, co-owner and head of pitching development of S2 Breakthrough. Today, we have a very special episode. We are live at the NSCA convention uh, here in Las Vegas, and I have a very special guest with us. We've got Nate Walker, president of Diamond Solutions. Um, Nate, we have had many discussions before, but I'm particularly excited about this one because we've never done it live. Correct. We've never done it in person. We're always over Zoom. Yes. Um, and I think just kind of coming off the last uh, episode that I recorded, which is just about understanding ball flight data, understanding how to take it from the training space into in-game to understand a pitcher, for you to just really be able to build on top of you know, what ball flight data is really all about. What is it that makes pitchers stand out? Uh, I'm just super excited to have you here today and really appreciate you taking the time in your busy schedule to join us. Oh, no, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ashley. And uh, I'm really excited, as you mentioned, to, to build on another layer of what we've already talked about. So cool. thanks again. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so I want to talk today about, first and foremost, just the fact that, you know, at S2 Breakthrough, what we spend our time doing is really diving into the player development journey and story for pitchers. And really, for us, what that means is understanding how they're moving outside of the motion, what capacity they have for the motion, meaning you know how well they're able to really move within the motion, what their biomechanics look like, and how those patterns influence and connect to ball flight data. For us, the goal is really about making sure that pitchers don't just kind of rely on results of tournaments essentially because there's so many variables there um results of tournaments to really understand like where they are compared to other you know pitchers across the nation what they can ultimately accomplish when it comes to recruiting and so what's been so great and this is obviously largely in part due to your the work that you've done collecting so much data across the country and being able to show us this is actually what allows pitchers to be effective at higher levels. That data has just totally changed the game. So one, I want to express just like total gratitude, appreciation for your ability to really have like put that out there to the softball community. But talk to us a little bit more, like when when we are working with pitchers and we are saying, you know, our goal is for you not to rely on sort of this like question mark, am I good enough? Do I have the tools to play at this level? And really when it comes to ball flight data, we talk all the time about like, don't be average, as you always say, because most people are. Tell us specifically what that means. What does it mean not to be average? Is there only one way not to be average? What are the things that you see when it comes to like, I am at a camp, I'm at a setting where I'm looking at pitchers. These are the pitchers that I set aside. What does that look like? I mean, the first thing you have to answer is like pitching is very complex, right? And so there's so many ways to get a get get a hitter out and, and really, the ones that do it better than others are usually more unique in, in, in the form of some form of a velocity movement combination, right? And if they aren't meeting certain thresholds in either of those categories, they need to have intangibles that, you know, are grossly above, you know, a, you know league average, let's say, you know, to, to, get, to get them through kind of that, um, you know, next level. But in terms of like going back to your question about what is what does it mean to not be average, basically I'm looking at some sort of combination between velocity and vertical, mostly velocity and movement, specifically with vertical break. And I, I want to have the, you know the, the ability to show some type of college that you know there's certain skills that scale at the next level, and you know not all data is created equally um, in that sense. So, for instance, like down ballers get less strikeouts than up ballers, but that doesn't mean there isn't a you know room for a down baller um, to be on a staff just because you could have enough unique 
sync characteristics to make up for not having a rise component. And so I'm looking for these kind of like magic combinations between, you know, some type of velocity threshold, some type of movement threshold. And if they don't have either of those, you know, some, some other sort of intangible essentially to um, get them to the next level. What percentage of high school athletes, when you're at any you know particular, and this is ballpark, you yeah. may not have the exact percentage of the year, but if you had to just gauge what percentage of pitcher at any given camp or sort of recruiting event would you put in the not average category? There were 100 pitchers in front of you. How many would you say typically you see in a given event that you would say this is not an average pitcher? In a good way? In a good way, yeah. yeah just like um, how many? Yeah. Um, you know, about fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. So it, it, the, the number's low. Um, it's you know, I, I just came from a conversation where I said the supply of pitching is is low. It's tough to find, and uh, uh, a lot of it has to do, you know those 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 girls that check all the boxes are extremely tough to find. And uh, but you know the I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that there hasn't kind of what you alluded to earlier. There hasn't been a ton of development in terms of you know specializing in what your story is in terms of how you would put it and then um, building and then essentially trying to buy into that over a course of a couple of years. And so a lot of, you see a lot of kids kind of average themselves out as I call it. So they like to throw five to six pitches and just, just, just cause they have them. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I would say 15% is who I'm flagging and kind of pushing to the front of the line for, for college coaches in terms of how to make their team better. Yeah, I think that's really, I just find that incredibly interesting because again, the work that you have done, you've given us this, this view of like, this is the percentage of athlete, you know, this is how low it is. This is yeah. what it looks like, I should say, first of all, this is how low that number is. And really our job, I almost think of it as like the underneath part of really, we've tried to dive into like, why is that? Why are there only 15% of people? And the type of work that we do is trying to say like, is there another tier of kid out there that we can sort of apply the right journey to and build that? And I just think, uh, I find that so interesting. I hope like you know, listeners are loud and clear, 15%, I consider like it's really low. Yeah, it is low. And I think to really say like, if the player development world starts to do its job, we start to have success. I would hope that, you know, year after year when we're having similar conversations, you could report back that this is growing. Yeah, <laughs> I mean. Need a goal. That, that's the ultimate goal. I, yeah. Everyone wants that. You know, travel coaches want that. I want that. College right. coaches want that. Um, you know, it's not fun, you know, you know, saying, you know, only 15% can, can. When I say 15%, I'm saying, like, those 15% have, like, a strong probability of producing good value at the next level. Right. And, you know, the, it just makes everyone's jobs more easier if we can get them a little bit closer. And in my role, with especially within college softball, I have to deal with a lot of pros and cons of, of a player and, and and if they're a little bit pushed further ahead of like, oh, maybe you have that spinny kid who's 16, 17, 100, but is only 58, right? Well, if she was at 60, 61, that's a way easier bet than at 58. And that affects all things in terms of roster spots, money, um, and, and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. And so to understand like, to understand like that three miles per hour, What's going into that? What's holding you back for being able to accomplish that? So to like have these really tangible quantitative goals for yeah. you to be able to say, if this pitcher had this, for them to know, like I have to make sure that my journey and what I'm doing in training is really leading to that. I think it's critical. And like player development is really not possible without this sort of database sitting on top of it of telling like, what are we working towards? So that's why I just think it's such an obviously connected piece, why we love bringing you on and discussing these things because it's really the foundation of what we know we're building up to. Yeah, it all goes back to kind of those thresholds that I mentioned earlier, right? Everyone think, everyone likes to talk about diamonds in the rough or like the gems that you find through data, but the reality of the matter is there's not one decision that I've not had to advise a college on that's not difficult, right? And then and a lot of it has to do with like the, the kids that we're getting are, are a little bit, you know, more raw than what you'd hope, but um, but but yeah, I mean, it, it just, it would make, you know, definitely, you know, my job, especially in other people's jobs, a whole lot easier if we can, what the data does is it helps you kind of define like, all right, what are those thresholds that you need to meet? And then how far into one threshold do you need to kind of bet your bet bet on to, to get to the next level, to make that decision a lot more easier. And the earlier you can start that, the better, because once you get into college, like we've talked about before, you have a very limited time to maximize your value. Four years goes very quickly, um, but but you know you only have so much time to, to make use of it. And, and so the earlier that can happen, the better, and the earlier you know your story and where to take your story, the easier it becomes. Sure. 
Okay, so switching gears, related of course, but switching gears a little bit to, okay, you obviously spent a lot of time consulting with college coaches. Now that conversation was a little bit more geared toward like the, the actual athletes, pitchers and their families and what they should be working toward. Now let's talk about the types of messages and the, and the types of things that you advise college coaches to look for in the recruiting process. So what are these things that you would say of like, here is where you really should spend your time when it comes to recruiting. These are the things that you want to identify and jump on or grab right away. Big thing for me is vertical components. Vertical vertical components play you know pretty heavily at the next level. Uh, I've said this a million times, you only throw from 43 feet in softball. So there's only so much time to make the ball move. And it's very difficult to create horizontal movement from an underhand slot. A lot different, that's a big difference from baseball to softball, um, especially as I've you know, looked at both data sets essentially. Um, and then the other one, other other factor, so you want to be unique in that factor. There's obviously going to be a velocity threshold that even with all of the data that we're collecting, velocity is still kind of, you know, the, the top dog in terms of, you know, getting yourself into, into the next level. And then the third one, which is big, is a change of, how is your change of speed and how is how does that shape play off your strength? The reason why I bring that up is because five of the six traditional softball pitches are usually within two miles an hour with one another. So when you're talking about one dimensional, you know, movement profiles all at the same speed, the expectation is to have them face hitters, you know, multiple times through the order. You need that change of speed. So the quality of that. So if you can check those three boxes, that's when you're going to start getting, a, you know, some attention. And then, you know, outside of that, it's like, all right, to what threshold are these kind of intangibles that we just talked about? And how far can we push this person, you know, in a game? And, and how do we complement our roster, essentially, uh, with what we're recruiting and what we already have on, on campus? Yeah. I think it's interesting to think about, like, to summarize, basically, velo, right? Yeah. Which is probably assuming, like, to be in these, like, low 60s mark is this minimum threshold, right? Yep. And obviously, the higher that goes, maybe the lower the break threshold can become and vice versa, sort yep. of like can often be a bit of an inverse relationship between these two. Yep. Um, so velo, like a, a, a strength as far as being able to separate pitches and some off speed that plays off of that. So the concept where you're saying like pitches have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pitches, they're trying to create more to be more effective. And in reality, it's like, it's not about the quantity, it's about really just like the quality of what you throw in to identify that. Quality always over quantity. I mean, the reason why I say don't be average is you want to, you know, there's always a, a, a role for someone on a, as someone who's worked with a lot of staffs, there's always a role for someone who's really good at one thing. There isn't a really a role for anyone who's average at a bunch. And yeah. so, um, you know, because there's always going to be parts in the game where you may need to get a lefty out, you may need to get, you know, a slap hitter out, you may need to get a power hitter out. You know, there, those are high lever, there's high lever situations and throughout a game. And there's always can be someone who can specialize that. So it's all, there's always low hanging fruit in that regard. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's way better to be unique because there's always a role to, to fit that in. Sure. And the more of those boxes you check, the more of a role you can essentially fill. Exactly. Yeah. And then and it's also a great way of not having to overexpose a kid, especially as they're um, coming into college, for instance. Like, you know, you don't have to start them against the top team. And if something goes wrong, they're not, you know, a little bit gun shy after that. So it allows us to put the kid in a position of success first, knowing like, all right, I'm good against lefties. You're going to start against a bunch of lefties and, and, you know, get your feet wet. And then once they kind of check those boxes and get more comfortable and then Hopefully after the you know year two, three, four in, in college, you're, you're developing another component to your repertoire, then you're more of a complete pitcher and, and, and you have a, a really successful career. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about some like in-game data. We're limited in sort of what we know as a yeah. community about in-game data. Um, tell us some of the things that essentially like, you know, would you advise college coaches once their athletes are there, here is how you want to leverage a pitcher like this. Okay, give me an example, some sort of like case study of, okay, I've worked with the staff, they have a pitcher who did this. To, in order to really maximize who she is, these are the types of situations that I would talk about putting her in. Can you give me uh, some examples of those things? Yeah. Just so we can have an idea of like, at the highest of levels, what are the conversations that you're having? Like, these are her tools, and maybe they won't change, but like, how can we maximize them? What situations is she gonna play best in? So I always treat this as like an expected outcome and an actual outcome, you know, situation. So anytime I go to a school, like we'll do like a generic kind of Rapsodo MRI of, of what their pitcher has. And then within that, you can have expected outcomes given how the ball moves. So for instance, you know, you have a lot of up pitch. Well, that's expected to do better against upward swing planes because, you know, they can't get on plane as easy as they would as if the ball was going down and into their barrel. So there's always kind of instances like that, that little clues that show, all right, this, this person could be better against lefties, righties, you know, up, up, 
upward swinging trajectories, downward swinging trajectories. And then what you do, what we do is we always kind of said, all right, all right, this is our hypothesis, right? Let's track this throughout the fall. So we're having those schools essentially face those hitters over and over and over again and see how far we can push that threshold. So if I say someone's good at, should be good against left-handed hitters, to what degree can we push that to? And then once we, after the end of the fall, once we have all that information, we're able to kind of contextualize everything and say, all right, you know, player A, clearly that, that hypothesis worked. Player B, it didn't work. What, what went wrong? Could it be a usage in, it, issue? So was she not like throwing the pitch that should be good against a certain swing, swing profile or, mm -hmm. or handedness or whatnot? Um, you know, could her data got worse? Like something happened. Um, she got hurt. Like there's a whole, dev whole, you know, smorgasbord of things that you can like go down. But we basically treat it as expected versus actual outcome. We have those hypotheses ahead of time. We test them. And then by the end of the fall, we kind of have a full, you know, layout of how you can deploy a staff. And most importantly, how far you can push certain people. And, and then once you do that, you have a game plan on how to get your way through the season. I always say like regional teams are 300, you're pitching 300 innings. How are you going to map out 300 innings with your current staff? Do you have a 145 inning pitcher? Do you have an 80 inning pitcher? You know, and, and then, you know, why, why are they 145 innings? Like, could they have a lot of spread between the rising and sinking pitches where it's really unique? Could that 80 pitcher just be someone who throws hard with limited movement, but fits well with the spinny pitching staff? There's so many different ways you can do that, but it all comes down to expected, you know, you have the expe expectation given how the ball moves, like with, with the MRI, like we talked about, and then we're testing it with the actual, and we're putting the kids in situations to where we can, um, you know, further, you know, see how much we can push it. Yeah, I think that is just like, that's incredible. And I think I, really this conversation to me is really ground up. It's like, yeah. what even, what are you even striving to become in order to make it to that level? And then obviously, and, and what are coaches looking for to make sure it's, it's you know, a two-way street essentially, so that when you get there, this concept of like roles, can you even play a role on a staff? Yeah. What does it take to play a role in general? And then what does it even look like to sort of like divvy out roles? So again, it seems to me like the more of these boxes that pitchers can check, if it's like velo, it's vertical spread, it's changed, they got all of it, then this is a pitcher who's gonna take on like a larger role as far as like breaking up those innings because essentially probably she's going to last longer. Yeah, like I said earlier, all data is not created equally. They're yeah. different, but that doesn't mean you can't find a way to make it valuable. Yeah. And so that's that's the fun part about why I get to do at the college level is, is like figure out how, you know, as they say, it's like a scholarship is like a, a contract, right? You know, if you're one call, one well-known college coach brought up to me, he's like, I'm, she, she said, I'm spending half a million dollars a year on kids to play softball. He goes, if I have, you know, 250,000 sitting on the bench, I'm not doing my job to maximize the money that my institution is giving me to, you know, put a good product on the field. And so that's all what, you know, you're not going to get, you know, the superstar in every in every recruiting class or, you know, or even develop someone to, to have a breakout year. But you can use all this information and the kind of like these processes like we talked about to figure out how you can put kids in a role to be most successful and figure out how they can work cohesively to have a successful, you know, season and a, and a staff. Yeah, I, I think it's amazing. It's obviously amazing work. And I think it's just a great job. It's like it's like a communication piece that puts everyone on the same page. I think at the yep. youth level, all the way up to the college level of like all of us looking at some objective piece that's going to tell us, you know, what we can expect and what role someone really should take on and how to maximize. It's a whole nother level that the, you know, the conversation that you're having with college coaches about, you know, this, you know, actual versus expected and, and really like divvying up roles. I think it's just a whole nother level of, understanding the story both the coach understanding the story the pitcher understanding the story know where that's coming from um and i just think it's incredible it's no longer just like by luck by chance by no, yeah. you know obviously like no one this is a, a ball flight conversation and no one is discrediting like the culture piece and everything people do behind no. the scenes but the reality is the heart of decisions really has to lie uh, you know on what's real and this is a way to really quantify and track that and it's just remarkable that we're at a point now where we can do that and um, like I said, I just want, I'm so glad that you uh, took the time to be able to speak with us today. Uh, I feel like every time we have a conversation, we learn more and more. I know so does, so do our listeners and the audience. Um, and I think just, again, just having this conversation that tracks like this conversation of ball flight, what scales, what's effective, how do you maximize it all the way, like grounds up. It's a great way for people to understand like what journey should I be on and what am I striving toward? Yeah, it's a fun conversation to have. Obviously, I think Softball is just scratching the surface with this, and that's what's most exciting about you know working in the space and, and with great people like you and, and the rest of the S2 crew. So it's, um, 
yeah, it's a, it's a fun problem to solve and, and it's exciting and, and, and really happy to, to be able to contribute to that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Nate, for being here again. Uh, it was a great conversation and uh, looking forward to having more in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for thanks. listening, everybody. Uh, stay tuned for the next series that we're going to launch here on Redefine the Circle, which is going to specifically uh, have our very own Carly Sewell, our strength coach, as our guest, where we talk a little bit about uh, strength and conditioning and the cohesion that Carly and I uh, really have worked to build uh, to make sure that pitchers are training to really maximize what they can do. So again, thanks for listening today. Looking forward to next episode. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on. Thank you.